Welcome to the Constitution at Work, a podcast that unpacks the constitutional complexities shaping South Africa's legislative landscape. I'm Daniela Ellebeck, and today we delve into the constitutional crossfire, a critical review of the legislation that has unfolded last year in 2023. Now, the F.W. de Klerk Foundation, known for its commitment to constitutional values, has been meticulously examining the highs and lows of parliamentary deliberations during last year. Today, we are joined by the Constitutional Programs team from the F.W. de Klerk Foundation, specifically Mr. Ismail Yusuf, the Foundation's legal officer, to unravel the intricacies of these bills and explore their constitutional implications, how they impact our lives as South Africans, or how they undermine our rights. Also joining us is Mr. Dave Stewart, the Foundation's Chairman Emeritus. Now, as South Africa approaches the 2024 elections, the spotlight is, of course, on upholding constitutional values, democratic ideas, and the rule of law. Join us in this insightful conversation as we navigate through the constitutional crossfire that has defined the legislative discourse in 2023. Now, Ismail, you recently wrote a fascinating article for the foundation, looking at the constitutional crossfire, looking at the highs and the lows of the legislation the parliament considered last year. Can you provide a brief overview for our viewers and explain what the foundation was focusing on? Absolutely. And let me begin, Daniela, by stating how happy I am to be on our first episode of the Constitution at Work podcast for 2024. Last year was a very prolific year for the foundation. The legislative landscape of South Africa in 2023 reflected a nuanced interplay of constitutional adherence, but also potential pitfalls. And so the expropriation bill posed significant concerns regarding property rights, emphasizing the need for precise definitions and safeguards for just compensation to align with constitutional principles. But we've also had the Employment Equity Amendment Act that sparked debate about merit-based employment and the potential violation of the right to equality. We then also looked at the hate speech bill, which introduced stringent measures against hate crimes and raised constitutional concerns around the freedom of speech. We looked also at the Bella Bill, the Basic Education Laws Amendment Bill, and its impact on language rights, which we deemed requires careful consideration, addressing potential threats to linguistic diversity, the National Health Insurance Bill faced opposition, emphasizing constitutional concerns related to the right to access to health care and freedom of choice. And so, too, did the General Intelligence Laws Amendment Bill, with its overly broad provisions threaten individual rights, necessitating a critical review to ensure constitutional safeguards. And the Electoral Amendment Act addressed historic uh, independent candidates for the first time but fell short in achieving meaningful electoral reform. So to ensure a future grounded in democratic ideals and constitutional principles, the FW De Klerk Foundation acts on behalf of all citizens in ensuring that there's active engagement in the legislative process. As well, that is a fascinating overview. And thank you for giving that to us. The foundation indeed was very busy and very prolific last year. If if those are just a few of the bulls that the foundation was involved in making submissions on. Dave, turning to a big topic, and I'm sure it will become an even hotter topic as the elections approach, the expropriation bill, the matter of expropriation without compensation. Can you explain the expropriation bill's purpose and what concerns the foundation had with regards to the property rights? Well, yes, uh, I'd just like to say at the outset that these seven pieces of legislation that this model has identified are very serious. The common denominator among them all is that they would reduce the freedom of South African citizens to operate in many different areas. So right from the outset, all these bills are a serious problem, and a serious problem on the eve of one of the most important elections in post-1994 history, the election in the course of which the ruling party might lose its majority, and that is a critical moment for any uh, emerging uh, national liberation movement government. 
So just uh, just an introduction. Uh, anybody will tell you that that if you if you undermine property rights, you're not going to get foreign investment. You're not going to get domestic investment. You couldn't have a more sure way of undermining any prospect for economic growth. Now, the expropriation bill uh, would make it possible for the government to expropriate property, paying nil percent compensation on an open-ended scale of, of uh, uh, possibilities and situations, including, including the situation if somebody occupies your land and you no longer have control of it, then you would deem to be a fair target for nil compensation. And there are many other examples of this. Uh, this would have an absolutely devastating impact on our economy, on our society, on our international acceptability as an economic partner. Uh, uh, the other problems that, that uh, that exists in the, in the bill, among oh, many others, are the inadequate definitions of the public interest. Property can be expropriated at no percent uh, compensation in the public interest. But who gets to define the public interest? If one looks objectively at the situation, the public interest in any normal society must include sound property rights. There is an absolute correlation between the level of property rights in a society, the level of freedom, the level of economic growth, and even the level of inequality. So who defines the whole concept of public interest? It can't be left to the government to make. And the same is true of the definition of land reform. I think all South Africans accept the need in Section 25 of the Constitution for a balanced system of land reform. But land reform could be anything from the state taking over all land that is expropriated, which I think is their favored model, to a situation where land is transferred to individual property owners. That would increase their power and their freedom. We have in this country over 9 million property owners who own their own homes. But 6 million of those don't have title deeds to their properties. So, so we're 100% in favor of expanding property rights for all people, but not on the basis of a definition of land reform, which would mean the, um, the transfer of power and land to the state. So these, I think, are problems at the heart of our expropriation bill. Ismail, do you have anything to add? No, I have nothing to add to that, but I'd like also to say that the suicidal mission that our ruling party is taking on has trickled down to so many different aspects of life and rears its ugly head through nearly every aspect of life reflecting so many different pieces of legislation and that's the purpose of this podcast today to really analyze how the government through that suicidal mission has taken on this what i'd like to deem a somewhat unconstitutional uh plan of theirs and you'll see those that that impact of their unconstitutionality uh in all of these pieces of legislation that we analyze today Ismail, do you want to talk to us about the Employment Equity Amendment Act? Because that seemed to flow that seems to flow quite naturally into what you were just saying about the unconstitutional aspects of the legislation they propose. Well, the EEAA, the Employment Equity Amendment Act, has been signed into law. It has been passed by both houses of parliament, Parliament's first house, the National Assembly, as well as the National Council of Provinces, and is now currently awaiting implementation. This act aims to address, it claims to address historic imbalances in the representation of different racial groups in corporate boardrooms and requires companies with over 50 employees 
to submit equity plans reflecting the demographic of their region and outlining steps to achieve these goals. It goes that far as well. But importantly, the act also grants the labor minister the power to set numerical targets for specific economic sectors. So what does this mean for the average South African, for the layman? In practical terms, this means that businesses will need to align their employment equity plans with the government's sectoral targets, with the government's agenda, potentially leading to preferential treatment based on race. Again, something that contravenes the right to equality in Section 9 of the Constitution. And so some critics have argued, and we do as well, that the Employment Equity Amendment Act undermines individual responsibility and the importance of merit in employment as it introduces measures that prioritize demographic representativeness over qualifications. And so therefore many see the bill as unconstitutional. Firstly, it introduces vague criteria for that racial classification and forces employers to apply these criteria in an opaque process, raising concerns about violating the constitutional principle of non-racialism. Secondly, it may fail the majority of poor black people by not effectively addressing unemployment, poverty, inequality. And thirdly, it extends public sector racialism into the private sector, and that too potentially infringes on constitutional principles. The emphasis, I think, on numerical targets and potential preferential treatment uh, raises concerns about so many different aspects, not just the right to equality, but the right in which employers are now bound to choose their employees. Uh, this legislation, I believe, could exacerbate the existing problems in our society rather than offer effective solutions and may lead to economic challenges by discouraging investment, by stifling growth. So where are we at the moment? Looking ahead, there are legal challenges raised against the Employment Equity Amendment Act with organizations like the Institute of Race Relations taking the matter to court, asserting that the act is indeed unconstitutional. But the debate continues with proponents of the bill arguing for transformation on the one hand and critics emphasizing the importance of a merit-based approach to achieve genuine equality and avoid unintended consequences on the economy and employment. So, Ismail, to summarize what you've just said, government has now said to private, private businesses, you fall within the retail sector in the Western Cape. These are your numerical targets that you need to reach. By way of example, 80% black employees, 80% colored employees, 6% uh, white employees. Are you then bound as a private business who wants to operate within the retail sector and you have over 50 employees? Are you then bound to reach these targets? Do you get penalized if you don't reach them? Are there in fact quotas? What, do you, what, what would you say to our viewers? Absolutely. So this is the very epitome of what we call race-based legislation. And while we mention numerical targets, one can certainly argue that indeed the threshold set by the government is tantamount to racial quotas, uh, forcing, compelling private business owners to select a certain portion of the demographic to be employed by that company. And that's accompanied by various sanctions, uh, if that's not the case. But the real problem here is that the government has a stake in who businesses can and can't employ if that business falls under the threshold, falls under the 50 employee threshold required by this new act. Uh, and, and that's another uh, instance of uh, government empowering itself at the expense of individual rights. Ismail, thank you for that. Um... To summarize, it seems that government is taking more and more power for itself and increasing its sphere of influence into the private sphere and dictating to businesses absolutely correct. and dictating to businesses how they should run. And I mean, it only takes looking at how this will practically the practical difficulties this will entail for businesses operating within specific sectors. Um, I mean, I know the foundation, for example, said that it would lead to um, massive unemployment within the colored community in the Western Cape. Uh, it will actually have adverse effects on some of the minority groups. Dave, 
But do you have anything to add on the Employment Equity Act and its negative implications for the economy? Because it all sounds wonderful to say, you know, we've got these targets, we want to employ um, everyone according to racial groups to make sure that people participate in the economy and everyone has a shot. Does What are the practical implications though, economically and why would the foundation say that this would actually do more harm than good? Well, I think the nature of the problem is illustrated by the reg regulations that the Minister of Labour tried to issue or issued last year, which would be disastrous for minorities if implemented according to the minister's formulas. It would mean that white South Africans would be limited to 8% uh, of jobs uh, in the upper echelons of business, irrespective of their, their qualifications, irrespective, irrespective of their contribution to the company's concern. But even more seriously, they would be, these regulations would be catastrophic for uh, the Indian and colored minorities in KZN and in the Western Cape, because if you're working for a company with a national footprint, like let's say Woolworths or Pick and Pay, in the Western Cape, you would be limited to only 8% of the jobs. You'd be able to have uh, you know, a, a regionally demographic share in companies that are just provincial. But it would be catastrophic for, for so many ordinary law-abiding South Africans would suddenly be told, sorry, we don't want you anymore. And of course, it would be catastrophic for the companies concerned as well. The point is that the regulations themselves are fundamentally unacceptable in a country based on non-racialism and equality. No, I mean, when you practically unpack the consequences on racial minorities economically, you realize how it sounds like this beautiful ideal, but practically it's going to do the exact opposite. It's going to harm people and it's going to harm the economy. And exactly like you said, it actually goes against non-racialism, which is one of the very founding values in Section 1 of our Constitution. Ismail. Turning to the Basic Education Laws Amendment Bill, what was the Foundation's view on this law? What does the law do? What are the problems? And what were the recommendations on it? Well, and I mentioned earlier that there's this trend, this pattern of the centralization of power into the government that perceives or that rather extends to this piece of legislation as well. Now, the Basic Education Laws Amendment Bill, the Bella Bill, is currently in the legislative process. It's been passed in the National Assembly and it's now under consideration in the National Council of Provinces. And the FW de Klerk Foundation, because of our many concerns with the bill, has written extensive submissions on this bill. And so let's answer the question, what is the Basic Education Laws Amendment Bill? How will it affect the layman on the streets? Well, the bill proposes significant amendments to a previous piece of legislation, the South African Schools Act and the Educators Employment Act. And it encompasses changes such as compulsory credit R, it criminalizes parental neglect of ch children's education, and it has ways of regulating home education as well. And while these measures aim to, it claims to enhance educational standards, we have significant concerns. And some of our concerns arise uh, from that centralization of power and uh, specifically the disempowerment of school governing bodies. Of particular concern is the impact that the Bella Bill will have on language rights with provisions allowing provincial education department heads to override school governing bodies decisions on language and admission policies. This has raised constitutional red flags notably with Section 29.2 of the Constitution, which grants the right to education in the official language of choice. There's been massive criticism of the Bella Bill, with many arguing that the Bella Bill poses a direct threat to Afrikaans language schools, as it mandates school governing bodies to submit language policies for approval to department heads, potentially undermining linguistic diversity. Now, we've written extensively to Parliament on the Bella Bill, but public participation in the legisl legislative process has been contentious, with opposition parties claiming that serious concerns remain unaddressed. 
the fate of the Bella Bill hinges on the NCOP and potential legal challenges. And this emphasizes the ongoing debate on language rights, on centralization concerns, and the need for robust public participation, as is outlined by sections 59.1 and 72.1 of the Constitution to align this educational legislation with constitutional principles. Public participation must be meaningful so that this increasingly draconian law uh, is made into something more constitutional. Esma, I found it so interesting, the term that you use there regarding the centralization of power, because in the democratic South Africa, we don't have state schools the way we had under apartheid. Uh, we have public schools, which our law sees as being community assets. They're public assets for the community in which they operate. And parents make up the majority of members on school governing bodies. So actually what the department wants to do with this Bella Bill is take away power from the parents whose children are in that school to decide what language their children should be educated in. I mean, this is really, again, as you were saying, um, centralization of power, taking away power and freedom from the people, centralizing a two central government, and even into the minutia of education. Ismail, you also wrote about the NHI bill. This again, I mean, we've just spoken about employment equity and we've just spoken about the Bella bill and centralization of power. I think this encapsulates that as a perfect example. Absolutely. And not only encapsulates that, but furthers the example of government intrusion into the private sector as well. Now, as of our latest update, the National Health Insurance Bill, the NHI Bill, has also been approved by both Houses of Parliament and is also awaiting, uh, ratifi uh, awaiting ascension into law by the President. Uh, the NHI bill aims to transform South Africa's healthcare system by establishing a fund to provide what it claims quality healthcare services for all citizens, thus achieving universal health coverage. However, there are concerns with this as well, constitutional red flags, and these are that the bill in its current form is deemed unconstitutional, but also unworkable and unaffordable. The NHI bill's impact on average South Africans is a matter of great contention. Proponents of the bill argue that it will offer more equitable access to healthcare services, allowing those without medical aid to consult private practitioners and attend private facilities, but critics like the Health Funders Association express concerns about its consequences, asserting that the bill poses a threat to constitutional rights, particularly the right to access healthcare and freedom of choice, as outlined in section 27 of the constitution. And so the HFA has petitioned President Ramaphosa to withhold assent, emphasizing con uh, constitutional and procedural concerns. Of those procedural concerns is that the bill in its current form is unaffordable. We simply cannot afford to give the kind of quality health care that this bill envisages to the public. And from a constitutional perspective, specific sections of concern in the bill, including section 33 of the bill, which grants the health minister considerable power to determine the restricted role of medical schemes comes to the fore. Uh, one can argue that this undermines the health sector in general, the private health sector in general, and concentrates risk due to the single fund model envisaged in the bill, thus impacting individuals' ability to seek health care in the private sector and overloading flooding the public sector. And as we've seen, government simply doesn't have the capacity to manage this, again, making the bill unworkable. More constitutional concerns also extend to the infringement on the right to access uh, of health care, but the freedom of choice. And by violating that principle of freedom to choice, uh, the bill potentially violates the rule of law. Uh, looking ahead, many legal challenges are anticipated uh, as I mentioned, with the Health Funders Association as well. Uh, other groups like Bulwant, like BUSA, Business Unity South Africa, plan to submit formal petitions to President Ramaphosa, urging him to refer the NHI bill back to the National Assembly for amendments. Uh, opposition parties, as well as Solidarity, have also indicated a willingness to pursue legal action against the bill, emphasizing these glaring deficiencies that I've mentioned. Uh, in essence, the NHI bill's journey through the legislative system has sparked intense debate uh, with concerns 
primarily uh, situated in the constitutional and procedural spheres. I mean, Ismail, as you were talking, I was just thinking about the fact how one of the founding values of the Constitution is the rule of law, which you also mentioned. Now, the rule of law also means, or one of its aspects is that the government can't act arbitrarily, which means it actually needs to act rationally. So you've got Treasury saying to government, we can't afford this, you can't do this, there's no way we can do this in this country. You've got this beautiful utopian dream, but it's not possible at this point in time with a country in the economic dire straits that we find ourselves in. Dave, is there anything you wish to add? It's the question of the rule of law and rationality. If there was ever a piece of irrational legislation, then it is the NHI. The, N the government has failed to listen to the Treasury. This would cost anywhere between 400 and 700 billion rand a year. That's as much as the country receives in total from income tax. It's, it is unaffordable. And the other uh, really disturbing factor about this is that the state, the government, has simply failed to listen to uh, really important stakeholders in the legislative process, as, is, as it is required to do. It hasn't listened to the, the medical schemes. It hasn't listened to the Treasury. And it hasn't listened to the fact that uh, if it were to proceed with this, a very high percentage of existing doctors would emigrate. Now, one cannot get a greater example of, of irrational legislation than this. And so I really hope that there is a legal challenge and that it is thrown out of the legislative process as it should be. That doesn't mean that we, we don't need a proper health care system. Of course we do, but the first step is to fix the existing public sector and to extend health insurance to people. Absolutely. Dave, I think that beautifully puts it in perspective because Unless you're expecting every single government employee and every single other government expense to suddenly vanish into thin air so that they can afford the NHI, there's absolutely no way they can use the entire income that they get from SARS collecting income tax from everyone on this one aspect. The rest of the country, it's I mean, none of the other obligations as a state is suddenly going to evaporate into thin air. And that just puts it into really stark perspective how not just impractical or irrational this is, but how impossible. Even with the best intentions, there is absolutely no way they can make this work in the current economy where there's only this amount of income tax that they're getting. Now, Ismail, that takes me to the Electoral Amendment Act, something that I know both you and Dave have a strong interest in. Do you perhaps just want to explain what this act does? And then, Dave, I know you mentioned that this was a missed opportunity, and perhaps you can go into that. Absolutely. So the Electoral Amendment Act presents us really with a constitutional quagmire. The Electoral Amendment Act has been signed into law by the president, and recently was upheld as lawful by the Constitutional Court. This legislation has emerged in response to a 2021 Constitutional Court ruling brought forth by the New Nation Movement, and essentially that Constitutional Court ruling obligated that there has to be provisions for independent candidates in national and provincial elections. However, the court's decision to, to set the signature requirement for independent candidates at 1,000 as opposed to 15% of votes needed to win a seat, is a mixed victory, or I'd rather call it a missed opportunity. While it opens the door for independent candidates in the 2024 elections, the votes that these independent candidates get will still lack parity with those cast for political parties. This dilution of the independent vote underscores the act's missed opportunity for meaningful electoral reform, especially in light of the new nation movement case, which initially prompted the court's directive. Also, the act's failure to establish constituencies or adequately address independent candidate participation also perpetuates a lack of accountability, 
which has also been something that is contrary to the court's original order in effectively addressing constitutional flaws identified by the court and disregarding proposals such as the Funzale Slubbard Reports mix system reflects a lack of political will for comprehensive electoral reform. The act in its current form compromises, I think, the foundational democratic principle of one person, one vote, as independent candidate votes may carry less weight than votes cast for political party candidates. So looking forward, I think the act shortcomings create really a constitutional quag quagmire, as I said, and a potential crisis. The looming 2024 elections raise concerns about the IEC's ability to implement an act that may be constitutionally challenged. The missed opportunity for electoral reform exacerbates a situation where elected representatives remain more accountable to their parties rather than to the electorate. And so I think urgent reconsideration is necessary to align this legislation with our constitutional imperatives, ensuring fair representation and accountability in the upcoming elections, but if not so, then indeed fostering a more robust democratic system overall. Now, Dave, I know that you and Isma have both touched on the fact that this bill was a missed opportunity. What would you have liked to see happen? Well, you know, Daniela, our present electoral system wasn't intended to be a permanent electoral system. It was supposed to operate for the first election. And uh, the uh, parliament appointed a committee to make proposals for amending the system. And it, uh, it uh, was published in the Pancel Slubber report at the beginning of uh, the century. And it made provision for a mixed parliament, 100 seats elected on a proportional basis, because the overall outcome must still be proportional. And then 300 seats elected, I think, from 69 or 79 multi-member constituencies. And the idea here is that there should be a direct link between voters and their representatives in Parliament. And this is more than just a question of, um, of constitutional and electoral niceties. This lies at the heart of the failure of our Parliament to provide proper oversight of government actions. What we have now in South Africa is not a proper separation of powers between the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary, because in effect, the executive controls absolutely members of parliament. Uh, if you lose your membership of the party that nominates you to parliament, then in terms of uh, the constitution, you lose your seat in parliament. So the party bosses have an absolute control over members of parliament, and this is why this is perhaps the main reason why Parliament has failed so dismally to hold the executive to account time after time after time, as has been attested by the Constitutional Court itself in a number of cases. Parliament wasn't there uh, uh, with the with the Encumbler scandal. It wasn't there with much of state capture, and it's because of the electoral system that puts uh, members of parliament under the control of the ruling party rather than the voters. Dave, that is a very sobering perspective when one looks at how our democracy is functioning at the moment. And Ismail, I know one of the things I'm taking out of this discussion is that when one thinks of democracy, one thinks of freedom. One thinks of freedom, one thinks of rights, and one thinks of responsibilities. And from this discussion, the bills that we've spoken about so far, it just sounds as if freedom is increasingly being limited. The state is garnering more power to itself, which means that our rights and freedoms are becoming less and less and less. And it just sounds like it's moving more and more towards a totalitarian state. In ending off this podcast, um, I just want to say that two other bills that the foundation has been involved in and which I would love to hear your brief comments on are the hate speech bill 
which criminalized expression that this bill sees as hate speech. Now, this bill is currently on the president's desk waiting to be signed into law. So it's been passed by South Africa's legislative body, lawmaking body, parliament. And what makes this bill very concerning is again what has come through this um, podcast again and again is the lack of clarity, lack of definitions. For example, the bill doesn't even define what hate is and harm, one of the elements of hate speech, is defined so widely that it even includes emotional harm, in other words, hurt feelings. So we've got a bill that wants to criminalize hate speech, but it doesn't tell anyone what hate is. And harm, one of the elephants, elements of hate speech, and actually the elephant in the room, is defined so widely that it even includes hurt feelings. Another one that the foundation will be commenting on soon, which is currently open for comment, is the General Intelligence Laws Amendment Bill, the GILAB, also known as the SPY Bill, which will give the state security agencies, in other words, the spies, the ability to look at people or organizations of interest and to decide whether or not to give them security clearance certificates. Now, people and organizations of interest is defined so very widely that it would include civil society organizations such as the foundation. And it seems to be that if you fail to get a security clearance certificate that you will no longer be able to <laughs> to keep your doors open, that you would have to close business. So we see these two laws that again centralize power drastically decrease freedoms and even the ability to to hold the state to account as the private sector being considered, one already on the president's desk and one in the first House of Parliament. Isma, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I absolutely agree with you. I Let me begin with the hate speech bill. I think that in the hate speech bill, not only do you have a bill that's very badly drafted when you have a hate speech bill that doesn't define hate, but I think that the implication for the average South African will mean not just a, a, a gross intrusion in their rights and the centralization of power, thereby deteriorating their essential freedoms. But this bill has very worrying flaws that could lead to self-censorship. Now, the constitutional concerns that arise here regard to freedom of speech as enshrined in section, section 16 of a constitution, as the broad parameters for hate speech definitions and increased penalties stifle open debate and free expression. One must also ask the question of whether or not this piece of legislation is necessary in the first place, as one can argue that existing constitutional protections do exist, such as those against unfair discrimination, in other words, Section 9 of the Constitution, those might be sufficient, and that criminalizing hate speech may infringe on the right to freedom of expression without a just cause. And the potential of those consequences of stifling speech include a chilling effect on journalism, on public discourse, and on the ability to engage in robust debates on important social issues. Dave, we seem to have a clamp down on freedom of expression and just freedom in general in our democracy. And we okay. seem to now be facing the possibility of being spied on as citizens as well. What are your parting thoughts? Well, Daniela, you put your finger on it. You know, one of the great benefits of the new South Africa thus far has been that we have been a remarkably free society. But all of the legislation we've been discussing today poses deadly threats to that freedom, and none more so than the hate speech bill. The draconian sentence of five years, eight years imprisonment is a, a threat that uh, hangs over any statement that anybody makes now because the definitions are so broad. And we know what the purpose of the legislation was because when it was first discussed by the ANC, an ANC member of parliament said, we need a law that will prevent the kind of statements that Helen Ziller made after she came back from Singapore. And Helen Ziller had uh, made a controversial statement in which she said that Singapore had kept some of the, the heritage from colonialism because it worked. Now, 
that may be controversial, but it is certainly permissible in terms of Section 16 of our Constitution. So attempts like this to crack down on speech that you, with which you do not agree are a deadly threat to the future of freedom in our society and to a democratic process in particular. Dave, thank you so much. And again, both of you, Ismail, as legal officer, I know you're inundated with work. Thank you for taking the time to educate our viewers on these very important topics. Dave, as chairman emeritus, always coming with so much wisdom and just a bigger picture perspective, which is so useful in placing exactly where these laws fit into the puzzle pieces of the context that we find ourselves in. Part of the foundation's work is to protect and promote the constitution, its values and its rights and freedoms as enshrined in it. If you would like to support the foundation, kindly consider donating to us. Until next time.